right good evening good evening glad to have you with us even on this evening god bless you uh, we are thankful to the lord of our god who uh, does all things well and we are appreciative of the goodness the mercy and the grace of god all week long god has truly blessed us kept us and we are just thankful to make it to wednesday aka hump day also our time when we come together study study the word of god and we have a great series that's going to get started on tonight. So we're going to ask you to go ahead and share with us on Facebook. Share, like, uh, and make your watch parties. Uh, if you're with us on YouTube, welcome as well. Thank you for being with us. And go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll be able to get all of our content that we have. Uh, our Wednesday night series, our Sunday morning series, which is uh, under biblical investigation, as well as uh, of course, Sunday morning worship services. So you'll be able to get all of that and get notifications. So you'll be notified soon as it pops up. And you can join and be a part with us even uh, in all of those uh, content that we have. So thank you so much again. Let us go ahead and talk to God. Let's give God, uh, talk to God, pray real quickly. And then we'll get started on our study tonight. Let's go pray. Father God, we come before your throne of grace and mercy tonight. Thankful tonight for all that you have done, for all that you continue to do. It is our prayer, O oh God, as we study your word tonight, that you would bless us and allow us, O oh God, to be able to learn, to grow, and to grow in the great and awesome thing of love. For we know, God, that love is essential for the child of God. And it is because of your love that we are even here. We thank you, God, and we love you. Bless your servant, bless your manservant, that you would direct my tongue, give me the words to say in such a way, God, that the things that are spoken will be clearly understood, that all that are listening may be able to learn and grow and be empowered by your word, that in all things, God, you'll get the glory and you'll get all the honor. This is the prayer of thy humble servant and thy people. Let us together say, Amen. 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 All right. We are starting our new series, our new series, which is about love. No greater, no greater thing uh, to talk about than that of love. So tonight we're talking about our theme for this month. Uh, would have been good to do the month of February. Doc. I didn't think about it. But uh, this month uh, we'll do love. So we're in April. This is going to be love month for us. That's what we're going to study, uh, surrendering to love. Uh, you with me, turn to the book of 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4, and I want you to meet me there. Uh, as we look at this text, John, this great apostle, known uh, by many as the beloved, that apostle that loved the Lord. Uh, we know they all love the Lord, but he is the one who had a dear, close, and very intimate uh, relationship. We see him... Uh, at the cross. We see the Lord Jesus speak to John at the cross about his mother. We see John in one occasion, the Bible says that John laid on Jesus' chest. We see John was very, very close and dear to the Lord. And John speaks more than any other, of course, to call him the apostle of love. Talks about love so much in his books and even his gospel has a different viewpoint, our vantage point than the other Gospels in the New Testament. You have, of course, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but John is uh, different than the others. He comes straight out not to tell you about the fact that he is the seed promise, as Matthew's focus was, that he is the promise of the seed. It's, he didn't come just to tell you about just his birth and all about his life. John starts off different than everybody else. John says, what I want you to know that Jesus is God in the flesh. What's important, John? I want you to know that he is God. So John starts out by saying, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we understand that John's focus is to let everybody know that Jesus is God in the flesh, and to declare unto us the great I am statements. We see them in the book of John. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the door, I am the shepherd, I am all of the I am statements we see. They are also 
in the book of John because John's focus is to help us to understand that Jesus is not just Mary's baby. He's not just Joseph's son. He's just not a carpenter, but Jesus is God, the son. Amen. So here in this epistle, now we're in epistle, when we get to 1 John, we go from the gospel letter of John and we move to these three epistles. And of course, we know that John ends the canon by the book of Revelation written to the seven churches of Asia. So we have here John's epistles to the church in 1 John, 2 John, of course, the third letter of John. Here in 1 John chapter number four, we find John in the whole book, he speaks about love in some way or some form or fashion. And he from chapter three, now in chapter four, we we'll pick up in verse number seven. So 1 John chapter four and verse number seven, you will find uh, these words here, have it on the screen as we're moving. Uh, the Bible says in 1 John 4, verse number 7, Beloved, our dear friends. First thing first that I want to say uh, to the family of God, John starts by his entreaty to them as he transitions to talk about the call to love. As he's transitioning from a different vantage point earlier in this chapter, he moves now to talk about love. And he begins by saying, my dear friends are in the King James beloved. The idea is these were the people who were loved by God. I need you to understand something this morning. The blessing is and the beginning of love is the fact that God loved us. God loved us first. Amen. God loved us before we even came into this world. God loved us while we were in a sinful state. Everything that John is going to get ready to say, we have to keep in mind that the love that we show to our brother and our sister in Christ, the love that we show to the world, the love that we show to our husband and our wives, the love that we show to our children, the love that we show in our friendships, all of this is because we are loved. The only reason that we are so blessed and still here is because God loved you. Somebody needs to know this morning or today, this evening, that the only reason you're, you woke up this morning is because the Lord loved you. The only reason you got out of your bed is because the Lord loved you. You are loved by God. You are loved by God. And if you are a child of God, then your relationship is even dearer than everybody else because you are his child. So John says to the children of God, to the family of God, to the Christian, the one who has this dear and true relationship with the Father through Christ Jesus. He says, beloved. He entreats them with a love entreaty because they are beloved of God. And he says, if you understand who you are and who you have been called to be, he says, let us, let us, that's everybody. This is a teaching that is not what one person can do and another person can decide not to. I need you to understand that love is something that should go through everybody. If you belong to God, then you should walk in what he's about to talk about. Let us love one another. Let us love one another. The beautiful call of love. Let me tell you something, family of God. I need you to understand tonight that they are the beloved, the esteem of God. We are instructed to love God, not to, uh, love God. We are instructed to love God because we are so greatly loved by God. A love we as children don't deserve. John talked about it in 1 John chapter 3. He says, I need you to understand something. And he struggled with it even himself. If you look at 1 John 3 and verse number 1, put that in the chat. 1 John 3 and verse number 1. I need you to understand that a lot of people will love based on what they feel a person deserves. We're going to get somewhere in just a minute. That's why I'm going to talk about the idea of surrendering. Because love has nothing to do with what you feel like a person deserves. Love has nothing to do with what you think that person should get from you. I need you to understand that love is not about the person. 
And we're going to get there in just a minute. But John says, let me tell you about this love that we all don't deserve. It was so great that it baffled John. It was a love that was so extreme that John in the physical, in the human aspect could not comprehend why God would love us the way he does. It even messed with David in Psalm chapter 8. David said, when I look at your handiwork, when I look at the stars and I look at what you made in the universe that are made by the work of your hands, David said in Psalms 8, he says, I ask myself the question, what is man? That you are even concerned or mindful about him. Why is it that you care so much about us? The sun rises and it sets just like you told it to. The, the gravity and everything in it works every single day just like you said it does. The planets orbit and do what they're supposed to do every day just like you said it, said it to do. The land and the water continue to maintain their association one with another. And they do it and be obedient as you've called it to do. But man don't always do what he's supposed to do. And man is the primary creation that God made. And he is the greatest creation of God. But the one thing that God made to be the greatest is has come to be the most disobedient thing in the world. I need you to understand that same way David felt. We see it. In the Apostle John, John, by the Spirit of God, says in First John three and verse number one. Let's look at this text. He says, "Behold." Whenever you see that terminology, and I tell the church all the time. Whenever you see the terminology, "Behold," that means look at this. It's almost like putting. John wants to put something on display. He's getting ready to put something on display, and he wants everyone's attention to focus on what he's about to say and present at this time. He says, behold, here in the text and perceive and understand with your eyes. He says, behold, what manner of love the father hath. And this is the part that I love that he's bestowed it. He's furnished it. He's given it to us by his own desire. This is beautiful because it, 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 one thing that I, 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 I'm so grateful for is when someone gives you something and you know you didn't earn it. You know you didn't work for it. Matter of fact, if anything, you know you don't even deserve it, but they grant it to you despite of you. The thing about the love of God that he's bestowed upon each and every last one of us is the fact that truth be told, we do not deserve his love. It was bestowed upon us. You didn't earn it. You didn't, we didn't work for it. It's not that we're so good that we deserve to even have it, but it's because of the nature of him that gives. And that's the nature of God. We're going to get to that in a minute. The nature of God. Love has to be your nature. Well, we're going to get there in just a minute. He says, bestowed upon us that we, us, should be called or referred to as the sons of God. I need you to come back for a minute. I need you to come back for a minute if you remember. And I don't want to talk about it too much because I know CJ is going to deal with some things uh, uh, this coming Sunday if God says the same. But the, remember the prodigal son. Remember how when the prodigal son, the Bible says he was down there with the pigs. He was down there in that pen. And the Bible says he, even though he was so hungry, he wanted to eat it. He wanted to eat what the pigs were eating. The junk that they were thrown to. And he said, the Bible says he came to himself. Now remember this. When he came to himself, he said... I don't even deserve, Lord have mercy. I need y'all to see this tonight. He said, I don't even deserve to be a son in my father's house. He says, I, I wish now if I could just be lowered down to be a servant. Because a son is given the inheritance of a father. But remember, right? The prodigal son wasted his inheritance on riotous living, right? He left his father, wasted his inheritance. And now he says, I've wasted, don't miss this, oh my goodness, come here tonight. He says, I've wasted what God has blessed me with. How many of us have wasted time? Mm. How many of us have wasted gifts? Mm. How many of us have wasted talents and abilities that were given to us by God, but we used them in other ways and other places and never glorified God with what God gave us when it belonged to him 
in the first place. I want you to understand something. The reality is, if we're like the Son, and we all are, because we all sin and come short of the glory of God. So therefore, by design of the parable, all of us meet and are in, were in some way and some time in our life in the same place as the Son. Let me tell you a blessing though. Let me tell you a blessing though, family of God. Listen to me tonight. Let me give you a blessing. The blessing is this. While we wasted time, Lord have mercy, while we wasted his gift, while we wasted talent in the world, on our jobs and everywhere else, we wasted God's blessings. Amen, somebody. We wasted God's money. We wasted God's stuff on our own endeavors of life and some of our own desires and lusts. We wasted it. God is so good, let me tell you, oh my goodness, he's so good that he'll let you come back home and says, I'm going to give you an inheritance all over again. Oh my goodness. And not only will I say, even though I feel like I don't deserve sonship status, because you lost your inheritance, you wasted God's blessings, amen, when we were in our sins, God says, I'll renew you, oh my goodness, I'll restore you. Oh, I love that song, Spencer. He restored me. I'll restore you to a place where you've fallen from by your own decisions, by your own lusts, by your own desires, by your own behavior, by your own decisions. But God says, I'll eliminate what you did. I'll give you back an inheritance and I'll put you back in son status and not make you a servant or a slave in the sense where you have no benefit of the master of the house or the father of the house. I'll make you a son again. John says, it don't make no sense to me. We wasted our stuff. We messed up our lives. We've done all of this and the Lord will literally give us son status where we are. Watch this. Don't miss this. You need to get this. We are on the level in son status because the Bible says we are partakers. You need to get this tonight. We are partakers with Jesus Christ. You need to know what you got. You are a partaker. That means you are a partner. You are in alignment. Whatever Jesus has, you also have. Oh my gosh. Somebody need to get excited. Somebody ought to shout at the screen. Somebody ought to say hallelujah in the Facebook. You need to understand tonight that you have and are a partaker. What Jesus has, you also have. You are sonship status. We don't deserve it. We don't even need to be looked at um, in, the, in the sense of a son. It, we don't deserve none of it, but I'm thankful to God that God loved me so much that he'll give me what I don't deserve. John said, I, it don't make sense to me. It really doesn't because the reality is nobody else would have done this. Nobody else would have put us here. How, look, let me tell y'all something. Y'all going to play with this tonight. Let, let's get real. Let's get real tonight. How many of y'all have dealt with people who've hurt you? Let's just be real. How many of y'all have dealt with people who have done something wrong to you? And maybe you all were close at one point or one time, but that person hurt you. They stabbed you in your back. They turned on you. They might have been a friend. They might have been someone you loved or someone you were in a relationship a, a close friendship with and while you may have forgiven them I know a whole lot of folk that say hey I deal with them with a long handle spoon y'all gonna say amen you gonna tell the truth tonight you don't deal with them the same way you did y'all don't see it you don't talk to them the same way you did y'all ain't seeing it tonight I need you to understand that God is so good God will put you back in the house even though you ain't did right by the house oh my gosh he's a good God that's a good God cause he'll treat you like you've never done what you showed enough did Mm. Let's look. He says, gave us this status. So now as I move on, I, I just want you to know that this is a love that is of God. So now as I move on talking about that love, I also need you to understand that John goes on to say back in 1 John 4, let's go back there. In verse number 7, he says, for love is of God. Now that's important. All right, we're going to slow walk this text. Love is for, all right, for, denotes reason or purpose, for love is of ownership, possession, comes from source. All right, possession of source. He is the source, first thing first. Meaning, if I'm going to be able to love appropriately, then I have to get it from the source. All right, y'all. The idea 
that I can love without the source of love has to be, by biblical definition, a faulty premise. Because I can't love like this in the Bible. Now you can like somebody, you can have feelings, right? You can have you can have man love. I'm not talking about man love tonight. I need to make a, a, a difference. There's a difference in man love and the love of God. Those are just two different types of love. We're gonna get into the Greek word agape. It's a totally different type of type of love that God is talking about that He's directing and comes from Him directly as the source of this specific love. Okay? Now, what, I, what I'm trying to get you to understand tonight, that you can't expect a person, an individual, I don't care how good looking they look, I don't care how kind they seem, I don't care how, 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 how entreating they may be, I need you to understand that no one can love you with God love if they don't know God. Mm. Because this love, this love that John is getting ready to describe and to present, that is also spoken of that should be directed from us to one another. Because remember, it mirrors the cross. Lord have mercy. First thing first, we need to have this right here right. And when this is right, then this can be right. The problem is, people are looking for this, but they ain't checked the person's status here. So you're falling in love with the person. You're getting in relationships and deep friendships with people who don't have this right, but you're connecting with them here. And then when they hurt you or when they cut you, Lord have mercy, when they do something to you, you falling out trying to figure out. And I'm telling you, let me tell you something tonight. This is written to Christians. So I need you to understand that just because folk are in the church don't mean they as, as, as close to God as they're supposed to be or should be. Because I'm going to show you here that he had to write this to the people of God. So what that, what that tells me is that even though you're in the church, it doesn't mean that the spirit of God is fully affected and taken over you and you fully submitted to the way where God's spirit can lead you and the love of God can be your directing source. So I need you to understand tonight that if a person is not in the closeness that they should be with God, who is the source of love, then they will not have the source of love to love you with. So do not be estranged. Don't lose your mind. Don't fall out. When a person don't love you and don't show the love of God, it's because their relationship is not connected with their God the way it should be. Because John is going to tell us and help us understand that if the relationship with God is correct and is in the proper light and the closeness that they should have with God is right, then by direct, by direct influence of God, they will love you with his love because God is the source that gives this love to that individual. Okay? Watch what he says. Those who, I'm written this down, those who claim God as their father, M-U-S-T, must, and John is going to say this, must. John is going to say in a minute, look, you are a liar. You lie. You, do, you cannot say you love God and hate your brother. You cannot say you love the Lord and you hate folk. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. A lot of folk are going to have some issues. They're going to have some trouble because of not loving folk like the Bible says. And I'm, this, this is a big deal. This is serious stuff. This is serious stuff. I need you to understand that love is not something that is conditional for the child of God. It is our direct instruction and command. And the only way you can perform the command is based on John is letting us know. He's giving us the information. The only way you can love with this love is based upon your closeness and your direct connection to the source of this love. The family of God bears the spiritual DNA of their father. Point blank period. One thing I understand that uh, when two people have a child, they bear their DNA. You don't understand that. Watch this. Let me help you. The seed is the word. The seed is the word. The Bible tells us we're born again, 
not of corruptible seed, but of first Peter, but of incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. I need you to understand that that seed is like this is the seed that birthed you. So therefore, if you're born again of God, you're born of the seed of God, which is of the love of God. So therefore, if you're born of the seed, the DNA of the love of God is going to be in you because you were born of that seed. The scary thing is people are claiming to be born of a seed, mm, but don't show no fruit of the seed. Look at John chapter 13. Get your Bible. John chapter 13. I'm going to show you it's a DNA. You ought, to have, you, ought to, you ought to have the DNA of your father. You ought to have the DNA of Jesus. Because he sent the spirit of God to plant and plants in you the seed of God. And it should bring forth the fruit of God. Right? Right? If God's spirit implants the seed, the word of God, in your heart, renewing your mind. Lord have mercy. You should bring forth the love of God. Amen, somebody. John 13 and verse number 34. This is how you know. See, there, this is beautiful because Jesus gives us some things in this text. I need you to look at it. Watch what he says. John 13 and verse number 34. Very interesting. And I love the first verse, but watch this. A new command I give you. Now, the reality is, when Jesus says this, it wasn't, it, it's, it's new, but it's not new. But I'm going to tell you how it is new. Okay? The command to love was not new. You can see that in Leviticus 19. It was not new. You can see it in the old, right? Love thy brother as thyself. We understand that that was a law under the Mosaic dispensation. We understand that it has been, it's been stated and it had been talked about. It was understood that it was a part of the law to love your neighbor as you love yourself. The first law, of course, was the primary and the first. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy, y'all know, with all thy strength, all thy strength. And then, and love thy neighbor, right? Because it was tied to that. I told you, you got to go up first. You got to love God. This has to be right before you can love your neighbor. That's why the, that law, that's why the laws work that way. Love God first because you got to get the source of love right before you can now contribute that love to one another. That had to be right first. Okay? So now, but Jesus does something here. He says, I'll give you a new commandment. Well, Lord, how is it new? It's new in this light because I'm changing the focal point on the condition of the how the love is to be given. He says, in the Old Testament, love thy neighbor as you love yourself. Gonna change that. He changes it. This is how he changes it. He changes the perspective. I don't want you to love your neighbor as you love yourself. I want you to love them as Christ or as I. What did you do, what did you do Jesus? I upped the bar on the level where I wanted you to be. See, this is why people can get complacent in love. Oh, Lord, have mercy. This is why we get complacent in relationships, we get in place in marriage, we get in places in our friendships, we get in place with our brothers and sisters in Christ because we are not holding the standard in front of us. So we love based on us. The Lord, the Lord did not call you, child of God, to love on your own parameters. Mm. He didn't call you to do that. He called you on a parameter that is so much in higher, high calling, great standard. And that standard is not oneself. That standard is abstract from you because you will have your own ideas. Amen, somebody. You will, you will mess up how you're supposed to love people because it will be biased based on what you think and what you feel. It'll be biased on what you like. It'll be biased on what you think. God says, I got to take the personal bias outside of love if it's going to be real love because you can't be trusted. Amen, somebody. Say amen if you can. You can't be trusted because when somebody hurts you, you ain't going to love them right. Amen. When somebody stabs you, you ain't going to just treat them right because you're, you got, they wounded you. You are hurting and you, it's hard for a human in its carnal concept to love someone when they've been wounded by that person. Amen, somebody. So therefore, you needed an abstract source to be able to draw and to identify and to set up your love from and not of yourself. So the Lord says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to love, but not based upon yourself because you will mess it up. I want you to love based upon the standard 
in which I loved you. All right, watch this. Here's the blessing. The blessing is this. The blessing is this. The question, this, this is how Jesus ran it all the way through. The question, it, it, you can line it up with everything. If you want to stop forgiving folk, then you also would have to ask God to stop forgiving you. Hmm. Just think about it for a minute. Just think about it. If you're going to stop loving somebody, you also have to want to ask God to stop loving you. Because God put this thing as or according to, I love you. So if you don't want to love them, then you are saying in essence, I don't want God to love me. That's the position you take in your mental framework. I need you to understand that God says you, your, your setup needs to be based on how I love you. And if I would continue to love you, then you ain't got no right. Ooh, Lord have mercy. You can't withdraw or withhold from somebody what I have not withheld from you. Come here, church. Come here, family of God. Come here, Matt. Come here. You cannot withhold love from an individual because you feel in a type of way. Amen. You can't withhold something from somebody because what if God did that? Hmm. What if God, when every time you didn't pray and thank God for blessing you with what you he's given you and you didn't acknowledge that God helped you to make it to point A, to point B safely because you were so busy trying to get to work on time to clock in for the man and get there and get your money because you didn't want to be late but you forgot to say thank you to God. What if God, every time you didn't thank him and didn't do it right by him, what if God treated you like we treat some other people in our lives? Mercy. Mercy, tell the truth. Lord have mercy. Listen, so must you love. M-U-S-T must love one another. By, by the notes recognition. By this. It's like putting something on the table. It's like putting this handkerchief and putting it on the table. And Jesus is literally saying, by this, right? Right? By this thing, that means... The world can recognize it, even as the Christian can. Oh, I need y'all to see this. The love of God is recognizable. I, I need y'all to get this. The love of God is recognizable because it's distinct. Mm, come here, come here, come here. It's distinct, meaning it's different than man love. Because man love says, when they talk about me, I'm going to talk about them. Man love says, when they do me wrong, I'm going to do them wrong. So that's, that's normal. The world has seen that love. They live in that love. They see that love every day. They work in that love. They're in that environment. You kill my homie, I'm going to kill your homie. You, hit my, you kill my dog, I'm going to kill your cat. It's, we, they, they live in that. That's recognizable. If you do me right, I do you right. If you treat me right, I treat you right. Jesus says, Matthew 6, that love uh, is recognized. That's something that everybody does. You're no different. They, they can't distinguish you from anybody else if you love based on that standard. But Jesus says, this love is distinct, meaning it stands out. It's different. People will see that. That love will make people stop and question. Wait a minute. Hold on. Now, I don't, I don't see that every day. Mm. This love will make you say, Hmm. This love will make you say, why you did that? This love will say, you still treat them good? This love will make the world say, wait a minute. This love will put people on notice because they don't see this every single day. Because this love is distinct. It don't come from the earth because it's not earthly. It comes from God. And when they see something that comes from God, they also get to see God. Oh my goodness. They get to see God through us. And the reason they'll believe we are connected to God is because they see the love of God, amen, somebody, in us directed one to another. So they will then draw to us as the body, the church of Christ, because they see the love of Christ in us. And they'll draw to that because when they see that love, they know that God is in us and we are truly the people of God. So now, John says, 
You need to understand that. You need to understand that as we get back to John. You need to understand that Jesus said that's the level of recognition. Because, see, people, a lot of people is not, are not going to come to worship. They're not going to come to the building. They're not going to uh, get, not, they may not do that. But they will have an opportunity to hear a sermon that's done at your job by your life and the love that you show. They can see it by the love we have one for another. They can see God in us. So as John goes on, he says, love is of God, all right? Love is of God. That means he is a source of this love and we are recognized by this distinguished love. Let's move a little bit further. Still in 1 John 4, verse number 7, in every one that loveth, not just, oh my gosh, because it's a continual thing, it's, it's a it's a verb that means you walk in this, right? See, you can love me today and hate me tomorrow. But the reality is what John says, I need you to understand, people who belong to God, this is just who they are. They're going to be this every single day, no matter the circumstance or the situation or what's happening in their life, because it's an external stimuli that will not affect their internal power and internal influence by the spirit of God, which has in, in, infiltrated them with the seed of God. And they now bring forth the fruit of God, which is the love of God, because they accepted the seed of God because they have the they are the possessed, are possessed by the spirit of God. I need you to understand that. It's a continual process. You are walking in this love. The Bible then tells us, everyone that loveth is born of God and, watch this, knoweth God. I wanted to get to this. It's so, so good here. Knows God is not in just an intellectual woman. And this, this is a problem in, even in the church. This is a problem even in the body of the Lord's church is a lot of people know book, chapter, and verse, but they don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus. They don't have an experienced, intimate relationship with Jesus. That he is just not a figure on pages and paper, but he is real in my everyday life. They've experienced scripture. Mm. See, it's one thing, oh my gosh, it's one thing uh, in the Old Testament, they, they said it like this, Spencer, they said that, uh, Enoch walked with God. See, it's one thing to, 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 oh my goodness, it's one thing to know Bible, but it's another thing to walk with the Lord every single day. It's another thing, it's another thing for God to show up in your life because you're walking by faith. And when you walk by faith, faith pleases God and God show up on your behalf and you've experienced the power of God. You've experienced his mercy. You've experienced his grace. You've experienced his deliverance. You've experienced his work. I, mm, Lord have mercy. I, the, the, Paul said in Romans that hope maketh not exchange. He talked about experience and experience because the idea is whenever you walk in the faith of God, trusting, walking by faith, then God, it activates God's grace because faith is the activation card of the grace of God. So when you walk by faith, you access, Romans 5 and 1, the grace of God. And when you access grace, God starts pouring into you his grace on your life, his favor on your life. Therefore, you experience the goodness, the deliverance, the power of God, and the intimate relationship grows even deeper with him. And those who have an intimate relationship, who know him, not just by Bible, but know him by experience that they, when they walk that Bible, because they live that Bible, they've applied that Bible, therefore they experience God working in their lives and they have an intimate now relationship like others do not have because they don't walk by faith like that child of God walk by faith and when you know him like that and God has done what he's done for you you have the love of God in your heart and it blossoms to everybody that comes in contact with you your cup just runs over 
And therefore, everyone that comes in, into your presence, everyone that comes near you can just, it permeates off your person. The love of God, it's, 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 it's so contagious, it's so powerful that it just pours off of you that people don't feel as good until you come around. Matter of fact, they miss your presence because your presence changes the environment because that's what the love of God does. It changes and affects the environment because it is of God. And whenever God shows up, the environment changes. And because of the God in you, you change the environment of those who come in contact with you. It's a deep, true, and intimate relationship. And, and this is connected. And I want you to see this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. The second part right here. Some of y'all done read it already. It's on the screen. As we know God deeper. This is what John is helping us to get. Because he says, Look, born of God and knoweth God. Those that love it, continual love. Meaning, the only way you can walk in this thing is based on your relationship with God. You having that intimate relationship. So, what that means is, the deeper I fall in love with God, the greater I can love my brother. Ooh, Lord have mercy. The reason why the husband can't love his wife as Christ loved the church because he don't know Jesus like that. When you learn Jesus, then you can learn and understand and have an intimate relationship with Jesus. Then you can love her like Christ loved the church because you know him. You can't, you can't because you have to have an intimate level with Jesus to be able to even enact that love towards your spot. Oh my gosh, y'all lay sick. Whenever you have an intimate love with Jesus, then you can enact that intimate and that love that God has given you in your own intimate relationship with him. You can now transfer that love to somebody else. As you grow deep in your love with God, you'll be able to love your brother and your sister your husband, your wife, your children, you'll be able to love them greater, deeper, and with a more purity and fervent love that is of God that cannot be quenched by their mistakes, ooh, by their issues, by their problems, by their faults, by their failures, but you will be able to love them past them because the love ain't about them because it comes from a place where God is a God love. And the God love is not about the person. It's about what was in God. <coughs> My goodness. Oh, Lord Jesus. Woo. I said I was going to preach tonight. I preached last week. So I know we're going to preach tonight. I'm going to try to teach. I'm going be, to be good. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. Listen. This is a beautiful thing here. This is a beautiful thing. This is the, it is the love that is of God. Now the word that is used, and let's go ahead and get to this uh, because I, I'm almost at my end here. I only got 10 minutes. Let's get to this. The idea is this. Love is of God. It belongs to God. It comes from God. It is of God. It, 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 is, it is who he is. God, it is. God is love. That's where we're heading. God, in verse number 8, God is. That's who he is. That's his essence. And there's no way that you can be directly connected to him if you don't love. Like, like, not just love, because there's different types of love. There's that uh, phileo love that using the Greek, that phileo love, that's that tender affection. Like, I got tender affection for you, you know, you know, you cool, we good, you know, you know, we cool. Just don't cross me, right? Just don't, don't do nothing crazy, because <laughs> then that's going to change, right? No, no, no. You need an unconditional love. You need a love that don't change by their, their condition and what they do. You need a love that loves them despite of them. That's God love. That's the love we needed from God. And that's the love in who he is. John speaks of that Greek, the great ancient Greek word agape. It is the concept of a self-giving love that gives without demanding or expecting. Thank you, Jesus. Expecting repayment. It is God kind of love. This is a beautiful love. This is a love that is not controlled by conditions or what may happen. It is a love that loves because it is just love. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful, man. It's, this is beautiful. It's, it's the purest love that there is. Which means this love 
is placed in us through our relationship with him. You can't get it any other way. The closer we draw to God, our relationship with each other, on whatever level, they will grow stronger. You understand, the closer you get to God, the better you will be for anybody and everybody else. The better you'll be. The closer you grow and get in relationship with the Father, the better you'll be for everyone that ever comes in contact with you because of your closeness and your relationship to the Lord. I wanted to get here if I didn't get anywhere else tonight. This agape love is a self-giving. You see that word also in the definition of benevolent. Benevolent love is a love that doesn't mind giving of itself. Not giving of what somebody else has. Because love is also sacrificial. Mm, it's sacrificial. And I'm going to deal with it right now. Jesus speaks of this love in this light and in this manner. According to the scriptures. Watch the Bible. The Bible will tell us in John 15. Get your Bible, John 15. He says it's an expression. You hear people say it all the time. And it is true in the connection that love is not what you say. Love is shown of what you do. Love is expression. Love is shown by my expression. By giving to you. By giving to you. By pouring to you. By benevolent. By how I treat you. That is love. A lot of people been in abusive relationships where people have put their hands on them. Been in relationships where people have custed you and verbally abused you, mentally abused you. I want you to know tonight that that's not, that's not the love of God. Because the love of God would never love you like that. Lord have mercy. That ain't love. That person don't love you. They're manipulating and controlling you. And using physical abuse, emotional abuse, and verbal abuse. Because the reality is, they have issues within themselves. You need to be loved by the pure love of God. And there's many people in this world, and that's why it's so important for Christians to express and to have that love. Because a lot of people have not been introduced to true love in their life. Je Jesus says here in John 15, talking about the sacrificial or the self-giving aspect and the power of this love. He says, this is my commandment. That you love one another. Right? This is what Jesus talked about. We already read it, right? As I have loved you. Watch this. Greater love. There's, Jesus said, this, Jesus said, there's no expression of love greater than this one. Listen to me. There's no expression of love, Jesus says, that's greater than the expression I'm getting ready to tell you right now. Jesus says, you want to know the greatest ex expression of one's love for you? That a man laid down his life for his friend. What is the what is the one of the greatest things that we have is our life, right? Self-preservation. You want to know how somebody feels about you? Let it be a life and death situation and see what they do. That's when you really realize how a person feels about you. I want you to know that Jesus says that the greatest love is to lay it down. That means that, watch this, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. That means, with this self-giving love, I'm willing to suffer to see you prosper. I'm willing to give up something that I have so you can have. I'm willing to give up time to pour into you. I'm willing to give up something of mine for the betterment of your life because the joy for me is seeing you prosper, to seeing you be blessed. And it, it matter of fact, it don't even hurt me because, oh gosh, ooh, oh my gosh, come here, come here, come here. This real love. And I, I can go to Hebrews chapter 12 and, and tell you 
that Jesus suffered. The Bible says for the joy he suffered the cross. I need you to understand that the Lord suffered but he had joy because he knew how it was going to bless us. He knew, he knew how we were going to be made free by what he did at Calvary. He knew how, how because of the nails in his hands and the nails in his feet, he knew that what the end would be. So when they said he saved others, but he couldn't save himself, he stayed on that cross. When they spit in his face, when they slapped him, when they did everything they did to him, he did not buck against it. Why? Because God could see all time at the same time. And he saw our deliverance. And he knew that our deliverance could not come unless he gave it up for us in that moment. So in that moment of his suffering, he had joy in his heart because he knew even though I suffer now, there's a benefit, not even for him. Good God Almighty. Because I'm only seeing this. He wasn't benefiting. I need you to understand something. Love is a sacrificial thing. It is. I can't sacrifice and not benefit at all. Matter of fact, I can go backwards. But it's okay because I see you go forward. That's real love. Real love is when it ain't about me, but it's about you. Real love says, I want to see you prosper. I want to see you grow. I want to see you. And I'll sacrifice me for the blessing and the benefit and the prosperity of you. Lord have mercy. Woo. That's a love we don't like to talk about. Because we're in a society and in the world right now that's it's all about me. And if, I, if I'm not getting nothing out of the deal, it ain't worth it. Let me tell y'all something. Jesus didn't get nothing out of this deal. He's already God. He already had the throne. Y'all ain't seen it. He already was with the Father. He wasn't getting nothing out of this deal. We were the beneficiaries of the cross. And if we are to love as he loved us, we need to stop looking for the beneficiary from our actions. And we do what we do because it's out of the purity of our hearts. And not for gain. And not for what we can get. But from a pure place of love and wanting to see others happy. And that happiness makes us happy. Lord have mercy. I thought of the idea, the concept, and I'm done. So my time is up. I got one minute. I thought of the concept, looking at the text of Romans 5 and 6. Doc, it is, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, while we were in the place, we were without strength. The idea, I'm putting on a screen, and I'm done right here. I love, I love, I love this translation. You see it just at the right time. When we were still, because the term without strength means powerless. We were broken. See, the firefighter realizes that the person that's stuck in the house, because as the fire affects the house, it affects the structure of the house. The things in the house are affected and they begin to fall apart. But there is also another element because where there is fire, there is smoke. And because the smoke in inhalation is debilitating to the human being, the firefighter realizes that the smoke alone will disenable the person's ability to get out of the house. Because many folk don't die from the fire, they already die from the smoke. Because the smoke suffocates them and kills them before the fire many times ever reaches them. And I need you to understand tonight that God is so good that I, the house was on fire. Thank you, Jesus. I say the house was on fire. I'm glad that somebody said, I'll come in the house. Oh my gosh. I'll come in the house. And you need to understand tonight that the fire was not set by Jesus. Y'all need to understand, the fire was not set by Jesus. I need you to understand that the devil gave a lighter to Adam and Eve in the beginning. Y'all ain't with me tonight. The devil gave Adam and Eve a lighter and they lit the house on fire. And ever since, the house has been burning. And ever since, every one of us is in the same house. It's the house of sin. 
But I'm glad that Jesus said, I'm going to come down and I'm going to go in the house. I'm going to get the people out the house and I'll die in the house that they may be safe from the house. Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad that God came and saved us from the burning house. Took us out of the, out of the place of everlasting damnation and got us out and put us on solid ground in Christ Jesus, in the body of the church of Christ. I'm glad that I got a firefighter that ain't scared to go in the burning house. I'm glad that I got somebody that had died before me that I might live when I was unconscious in the smoke of sin. In the in hell, I wouldn't even know more conscious. I didn't understand what I was doing to myself. Lord have mercy. But I'm glad tonight that Jesus came in the house and he saved us all. And I'm telling folk tonight that you ought to be thankful to the God of heaven that we had a firefighter by the name of Jesus came down and came into that old house of sin started by our own behaviors and our own actions oh we lit the house on fire and the house been burning ever since and it would have collapsed and all of us would have been lost forever but thank God for Jesus so I tell you tonight that this is a soul of good love a love of a firefighter a love that says I'll die that you might live I might die today, but you will live and be happy for many days to come. That is a true love. God bless you tonight. God bless you tonight. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. God is good. God is awesome. As, as, as Calvin say, God is awesome. I hope you watch it, Cal. God is awesome. Amen. Put it in there. God is awesome. He's my firefighter. Took the burning that I took, the wound that he took it, took it from me. That's a good God. That's a good God. And every day I live, I'm going to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you because you love me the way you did. Ain't no way, ain't there's no way that he can love me that good and I can hate somebody else. Just can't do it. We can't do it, family. Can't do it. Can't do it. God bless you tonight. Listen, if you're not a child of God, I call you. I encourage you by by the love of Jesus, by the mercy of our God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, died for you and for me, took our place, which should have been our nail, should have been for us. But thank God for Jesus, that he died at that old rugged cross, that we might have life and have it more abundantly because he died on Friday. But early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. And I'm thankful to God because he got up. Everybody that died in Christ going to get on up from the grave. One of these old days. And I can't wait. I can't wait. That's going to be a day to behold. But you better be ready for that. You better have your ticket. Because there's a first class There's a first class flight. See, I'm getting on a flight coming soon here this weekend. I know it's a... Hey, look, there's a difference between... There's a difference between first class and coach. Yeah, amen. I want you to know the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, the dead in Christ shall rise first. But make sure you got your first class tickets. Your ticket. To a heavenly home on the other side. But you got to die in Christ. And how does a man get in Christ? You got to believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. You got to believe that with all of your heart. Be fully persuaded and convicted that he died, buried, and rose again. You have to change your mind. Turn away from a life of sin and turn to God. That's repentance. God commands men everywhere to repent. Then you got to make the great confession. That's acknowledging. That's an acknowledgement that Christ is the son of God. Then you got to meet him at that old great old occasion. That's commanded by Jesus, worked by Jesus, and that is baptism. When the Lord our God meets you in the water, according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 through 13, cuts away the body of sin, washes you by the blood of Jesus, and it's for Acts 2.38, the remission of Acts 22.16, the washing away of your sins. And that's the occasion, according to Acts 22.16, that you are calling on the name of the Lord, appealing to his grace and mercy because of your obedience Faithful obedience to his command. That can be your blessing. And the Lord through that will add you to his church. The one he died for, bought with his blood, purchased it, established in the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38 with Peter. Same thing. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And I tell you the same thing that he told them so long ago. And it's still good today. For if it saved them, you see the old song, it was good for Peter. It was good for Paul. It was good for Peter. It was good for them. It's still good today. 
The grass withered, the flower thereof faded away, but the word of God endureth forever. God bless you tonight. God bless you. We're going to dismiss here in just, just a second. A couple of announcements. Thursday morning, if it's the Lord's will, Thursday uh, evening, tomorrow, we'll have our, TV, our Thursday night devotions. Uh, C.J. Charles Johnson will lead that on tomorrow night, so don't forget it. Friday, TGIF. Uh, Charles Johnson again. Amen. Praise the Lord uh, for him working and doing those things. Then on Saturday, if you have the primary class, on Saturday, we have Sister Erica Roberts is here with the young people at 930, the primary class, right here at the building for a, a, a Sunday school class. Normally Sunday, but we have it on Saturday. So Saturday school, amen. Come on out, be with Sister Erica. That's every Saturday she does that. And then on Tuesday night, uh, Sister Debbie, of course, does it via Zoom. So don't forget, they correlate together, primary classes. Don't forget those. Then, of course, on Sunday is the Lord's Day. Pray for me. Pray for the family. Uh, I'll be traveling to Alabama for the Lord's will uh, for the homecoming there at Southside. I'll be preaching there. Pray for uh, God to bless me to get there. Amen. That my flame plane go up and come down. Amen. And that God will give me preaching power that I may be able to give somebody a word for the Lord. And, of course, pray for my family, my wife, and kids also will be going to Atlanta. Pray for them for a traveling grace as well. And that in all things, God will allow us to make it there and make it back safely. Continue to keep everybody in prayer. You know the prayer list. Pray it on Wednesday. Let's continue to keep our brothers and sisters in pray, prayer. Pray for everybody, as CJ says. And we won't miss nobody. God bless you. Let's close out with a word of prayer. Amen. Father God, we thank you tonight. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for your love. Lord... Thank you for just loving us. Loving us when we are unlovable. Forgiving us for things that are to many unforgivable. But your love reach passes our disgrace, our degradation, our actions of defilement. It reaches past it. And your blood has the power to cleanse it. Lord, we thank you tonight. I pray that the words of my mouth this tonight bless someone, help someone, encourage someone, inform someone, strengthen someone. That in all things, God, you might get the glory, the honor. It's not about us, but it's about us being able to display the DNA, the love DNA of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because what this world needs right now is love. Hatred, envy, strife, and pride have taken it by storm. But we know that love is the healing agent. It is the bomb. It is the power. It is the coals on the head of our enemies. Help us, God, to love as you have loved. And as we dismiss from this class, whenever your presence, God, be with us, go with us, protect us, keep us, watch over our families, our loved ones, continue to guide us and protect us. We'll be sure, God, to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise that you so rightfully deserve. This is now our prayer that we live. In the mighty, the awesome, and surely the majestic name of Jesus, that all God's people together say amen and amen. Thank you all so much. God bless you. And if it's God's will, we'll see you next Wednesday.